Good evening, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. I'm Hania Salah, director at the Columbia Global Center in Amman. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to what I'm confident will be a fascinating discussion. This evening's guest, Bernard Khoury, is well known by many of you, to many of you. An eminent and internationally acclaimed architect, his cutting edge designs and provocative projects have left their mark on the field of architecture and beyond. Bernard, we are honored to have you with us tonight. The son of architects, Bernard grew up in France and Beirut during the Civil War period. He traveled to the United States to study architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design, and from there moved on to Harvard University, where he earned his master's degree in architectural studies. Upon completing his degree, Bernard returned to Beirut and in 1993 started an independent practice DW5 as an open platform for architects, planners, and designers. Post-war Beirut became his territory of experimentation. And over the years, DW5 earned a global reputation in a diverse portfolio of projects in Lebanon and around the world. Two projects that gained him acclaim early on and that will likely be recognized by many of you are B018, the music club resembling an underground bunker, constructed on the remains of a refugee camp in Beirut, and Centrale, a restaurant housed in the recuperated ruin of a 1920s residential structure located near Beirut's Green Line. These, among many other projects, built him a reputation for his ability to produce critical interventions in problem zones. To quote an article, a Financial Times article, as Beirut has emerged from the shadow of civil war, plastering over urban scars of past violence, Khoury's buildings stand out as provocations. With overt references to war and a radical interaction with urban space, they critique the city. Bernard co-founded in 2008 the Arab Center for Architecture, an association for the preservation and dissemination of modern Arab built heritage. He has been a visiting professor at several design and architectural schools, including the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and l'École Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris. Bernard has lectured and exhibited his work in over 150 institutions, including a solo show of his work at the AD's Architecture Forum in Berlin and at the Spacio per l'Architectura in Milan. He has also participated in numerous group shows. In 2014, Bernard was the architect and co-curator of Bahrain's National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale's International Architecture Exhibition. Um, Bernard was awarded the honorable mention of the Borromini Prize by the Municipality of Rome in 2001, the Architecture Plus Award in 2004, and the CNBC Award in 2008. He has also been nominated for numerous prestigious awards, such as the Aga Khan and the Mies van der Rohe Awards. In 2020, he was nominated Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres by the French Ministry of Culture. And now, please join me in welcoming Bernard Khoury. Thank you. Can we turn off the lights? So that if some of you want to go to sleep, <laughs> they can go to sleep. OK, so I was here about uh, 10 years ago. And I couldn't help this morning when I was driving uh, into Amman, noticing that uh, this place has changed, at least its morphology has changed a lot. Just like Beirut has changed a lot over the last uh, few years. I will be talking about uh, my uh, experiences in Beirut over the last 20 or so years tonight. I, um, I don't intend to give you a very objective picture of my dear city. Uh, I don't believe in definitions because I think definitions are too consensual and they tend to dismiss uh, what doesn't fit the consensus. So I'm not friends with definitions and you will see through a select few projects 
the contradictions I faced, my own contradictions, and um, uh, my very contradictory stories about uh, my dear city, my very schizophrenic city. So I will only be talking about Beirut and um, some of the Beirut projects. And, uh, and I will not be talking about, we've in fact worked in 16 or 17 different cities so far. Um, but I am, I am, I am um, I'm a very serious believer of the local. So I consider myself a local in Beirut. My first project, uh, the first project we'll talk about tonight is, um, is my first experiment on Beirut. It's going to take us over 30 years back. And uh, back then I was, I was uh, in the comfort of my academic cocoon. I had the chance to work with a wonderful architect, uh, for those of you who know Lebius Woods, Lebius in the early 90s was, was very busy working on uh, the Balkans, which who were, well, they were waging their own wars back then. Beirut was supposedly coming out of a 15 years conflict, supposedly I say, and in the comfort of my cocoon, um, uh, I, I did my first experiment on, on Beirut and on the scars of what the 15 years conflict had left behind. And more precisely, uh, the buildings that were very severely damaged by the 15 years conflict, uh, just like Lebius, my mentor at the time, I was fascinated by war and architecture and, um, and uh, the impact of, the, of, of war on buildings. So we worked on this, uh, on this generic ruin, which I literally built as a model. And this project called Evolving Scars is about the disappearance of these ruins um, while still maintaining, uh, while still being very concerned about questions of memory. As uh, already by the early 1990s, uh, the bulldozers of the, of the private company which was in charge, which later became in charge of the reconstruction of the city center, which was in no man's land during the 15 years, these bulldozers were basically wiping out all traces of that conflict. So I was worried about this memory disappearing and maybe very naively thought that some sort of collective memory could be gathered through the demolition of these buildings. See, usually architecture is about erecting matter, but already back then I was uh, interested by just the opposite, the disappearance of matter. So this was about the demolition of these buildings while collecting memories. Uh, and I tried to establish a very clear correlation between the amount of memory being collected in megabytes or gigabytes and the amount of matter being demolished. So what you see here is the memory collector eating up the ruin and the ashes of the ruin being collected in, uh, around the, uh, the, the ruin, the periphery of the ruin. In a, in a transparent membrane. You see it here in action in my model, and you see the membrane uh, being uh, filled up almost to its point of saturation until it gets saturated and the whole thing would collapse, leaving behind an immaterial memory, the memory uh, that would be collected during the process. So the material memory would go and would be replaced by another memory. The anecdote here is that Beirut, which has six archaeological layers, would have now layer number seven, which would be immaterial. I revisited this project years later with more um, contemporary means of modeling and drawing uh, for an exhibition. <clears throat> and you can see here the, the memory collector taking shape, uh, resembling the cockpit of an Apache helicopter. Um, and here a diagram showing very clearly the amount of memory collected, the rubble, uh, at stage zero, uh, the ruin, and then gradually the ruin disappearing and, um, and the memory collected until its point of saturation and its implosion. Ten years later, uh, Eolnik's car is still haunting me. Um, maybe Central is the grandchild of, of, of evolving scars, but this time in a, in a practical project located at the very edge of the city center, or the former city center. Uh, and at the time, a lot of uh, these historical, so-called historical structures were being rehabilitated. 
and I felt a bit uncomfortable about the rehabilitation uh, that was performed by the so-called preservationists, which consisted mostly of um, restoring the facades uh, behind which another animal would be built, um, sort of face-off operations. So you would give the facade its supposed glory back, uh, you would redraw a postcard with pastel colors, but inside, behind that, would be a contemporary structure. I would call these transvestites, and I was a bit, I was a bit uncomfortable with that. And our program called for a complete got-out job, and in order to do that, you have to do a very perilous structural exercise, which consists of putting temporary beams, or belts, they call them, on the periphery of the facade, which you see here, and then gradually demolishing what's inside and erecting a new structure. So at the end of the day, you see the plan, uh, which um, shows very clearly that there are no longer any bearing walls. The black uh, peripheral, inner peripheral wall here is the new structure. And uh, what we were doing inside was just simply a restaurant with uh, no partitions. And what you see here is the plan with one uh, very large table that sat over 40 people. In the center of it is a circuit of the waiters where uh, the waiters serve you through. They never, sh they never share the space you're sitting in. And uh, they're trapped. They're prisoners of the, of the table. Their only escape is the stairs that takes them down to the kitchen where they belong. If you look closer at the section, and you follow my cursor, you will see that the waiters were walking 40 centimeters lower than the plane you were seated on, so that you always look down at them uh, in this very cathedralesque space. It was a very uncomfortable space, and I meant it that way. Uh, a bit too dramatic for a restaurant, I guess. And that's the result. So you see a very pastoral table with very high back chairs that were very heavy. And what you see facing the plates are not microphones, they're pilot lamps that light up your plate that becomes a reflector. Some people loved it, some people hated it. But uh, I was staging a, a post-war um, bourgeois society living in marvelous denial. That's how I used to call it. And <clears throat> so some people hated it, some people loved it. But you certainly could not speak to anyone when you were on this table. It was very. It was, very, uh, it was a very heavy, yet uh, dramatic atmosphere. Um, so this is a section showing the height of the space, which was about twice its width. And on, above the, the main restaurant hall was a bar, uh, which replaced the, uh, the pitched roof, which was gone. And the bar is a tube that's 17 meters deep that we built, like you build a ship hole. And, um, we did not restore the facade. We kept the temporary belts or beams on the facade. And uh, to protect the guests, we applied a wire mesh uh, layer over that so that the, the plaster that was peeling and slowly degrading would not hurt people as it's falling down and would remain inside this cage. And I call this the poetry of decay. And that's the bar upstairs. Um, a chunk of the bar, well, the bar was also a convertible structure. Uh, a couple of years before that, uh, I built my first project, which maybe many of you know, uh, the BO18 Club, which is built on the site of a former uh, Palestinian refugee camp in the Carantina area. and. Um, for those of you who don't know the, the history of the, um, of the, of the, of the zone, uh, if you follow my cursor, there was a wall here that separated the quarantine from the rest of the city. This main artery that feeds Beirut uh, in and out uh, northbound. So we couldn't really see what was happening behind that wall uh, prior to 1975, 76. Uh, it was uh, a very miserable camp. Not only Palestinians, but Syrians and Kurds and also Lebanese from uh, the southern border who had fled uh, also the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the territory which was, uh, which was uh, problematic back at the time. So uh, about 17 years, 18 years after, or maybe close to 20 years after the, um, the, um, the massacre of the quarantine, 
I'm asked to build a nightclub on on uh, on that um, on that plot, which is a bit difficult. Uh, in the early and mid 90s, Beirut was in complete denial of its uh, of its recent past, and a lot of things were put under the carpet. This is a very visible site, but I decided to make a building that was invisible during the day. So you drive by on the highway and you don't see it. And I thought that the void left by the destruction uh, and the disappearance of the camps, uh, in contrast to the extreme concentration you see across the highway, was, uh, was very dramatic. Um, so I decided to preserve that void. And at night, the building wakes up um, and its roof opens up. Uh, the club is under the ground, about three and a half meters under. So this is it during the day uh, when it's sleeping, and this is it at night when it wakes up. And the panels let the sound uh, escape um, um, because there's nothing around us in the quarantine, a region that is still very doomed. If you look at an aerial photograph uh, or a map of Beirut, around this region there's something very strange. The city bypassed the quarantine as it was sprawling northbound. Uh, and that's mainly because of uh, its, its very heavy past and heavy present. And to this day, the quarantine remains this very strange fabric that never really was never really revived. So this is it more recently. You can see people getting out of the club at uh, 6, 7, 8 in the morning. Uh, early drawings of the club, which uh, I designed solo at the time. I did not have uh, an office. I was pretty much on my own. So modeled every single bolt of it with very primitive modeling tools and ended up building it with, uh, with a coach builder, someone who, someone who built um, garbage trucks. For him, it was a piece of cake, but for contractors in the construction industry, it was an impossible project. So it turns out my alliance with these, with, these, um, with these artisans was great. In the early years of my career, when the projects were smaller, we could experiment with them. Obviously, when you move up in scale, it becomes more difficult. You have to deal with all these procedures, and the profession becomes much more uh, limiting in that respect. But in my early years, we did a lot of experimenting with, with, um, with contractors and, and, um, and artisans who did not belong, were not part of the construction industry. And these were, were great people who taught me a lot. Yabani is, my last, uh, is the last project of the entertainment chapter uh, that followed Central. So there's like two, three years in between the beginning and the, and the, and the last uh, entertainment project. Um, all three projects are on very uh, problematic uh, zones or plots. This is located uh, on Damascus Road, the former demarcation line between East and West Beirut. And as you can see in this picture, the building next door was still squatted at the time uh, by refugees. Uh, mainly Syrian workers were uh, low-wage workers working for two, three hundred dollars a month. And the client comes to me and, and, and commissions me a sushi restaurant and bar that would serve sushi at $100 a pop. So any serious architect um, would walk away from such a uh, commission. Um, but I decided not to turn my back to Beirut's absurdities and, uh, and in fact uh, take that project as sour and as complicated and explosive as it was. So Yabani starts with um, with the celebration of the absurdity or the impossibility of its existence on this particular site. And um, the main hall obviously is not uh, above ground, it's under the ground. What's above ground is only the reception tower and the mechanical tower above it. So you arrive and you enter this vitrine and right next door, and you're basically staged right next door and in complete contrast are refugees working or leaving uh, with no handrails, no running water, no windows, um, <clears throat> and you're about to eat sushi at $100 a pop. This is not a photomontage, this is for real. And once you're below, uh, your only relationship to the outside is the sky and nothing but the sky. Um, the plan has the uh, precision of a Swiss watch. In the center of the plan is a circular platform or room that moves up and down in the center of the, uh, of the plan. 
it takes you from ground floor uh, down uh, to the first level underground, smack in the center of the bar. So you can eat your sushi in complete denial of what is literally behind the wall. This was 2002. Uh, we had, I think, a seven or eight years lease. By 2009, 2010, uh, the restaurant had to clear the, pre the premises as the lease was over. And uh, in 2011, uh, we had a war in Syria, which is still not over. So in the meantime, the building next door that you see here got rehabilitated, probably because of our presence. So they kicked the uh, refugees out and uh, pretty soon the building became a very posh, nice building um, for the young uh, bourgeois uh, who could afford uh, to rent um, in that region which was uh, already, which was already, which had been rehabilitated. So by 2009, when we leave uh, a year or two later, a family of Syrian refugees uh, comes uh, to guard uh, the property and they recuperated my central, my circular um, reception room, and they made it, they, they converted it into their living room. And uh, I, I just love how that, how the story of this building ends. Um, and the kids were very happy. I got to visit the family. Uh, they were very happy living there. Uh, but, uh, you know, grandeur et décadence, this is what, this is what uh, the city does to you. Uh, Beirut is a city that, that moves uh, in very unpredictable ways. And as much as my first three buildings were temporary buildings, and I was very proud to, uh, to say that I was, unlike my peers and my colleagues in Europe who were working on permanent structures, the first six projects I ever built uh, were temporary projects that had expiry dates uh, that were given to me before I even designed them. BO18 initially, the B018 club, was five years. Five years after we had erected it, we were supposed to be out and it was supposed to be bulldozed. Central, I think, was nine years, so was Yabani. So that's very strange for an architect because you're trained to work in permanence. We're probably the last <coughs> profession uh, that is still stuck in the Stone Age, that has a very strange relationship with temporality. And with that comes a great sense of responsibility relative to context, history. How are your buildings going to survive you huh? as you build things, you know, from, the, uh, from Stonehenge to, uh, to the more contemporary buildings uh, of our times? Um, we, we, we are six feet under and our buildings remain. So there is very, there's this very strange relationship with temporality that I think other mediums and other creative fields are more liberated from. Uh, and I think meaning is created today, nowadays, in, in far more dynamic and fluid and, and um, uh, mediums, um, spontaneous, I would call it, much more spontaneous than architecture. We have a problem with temporality. I did not. In the first six buildings I made, I was very proud uh, to tell my colleagues and peers in Europe that, who are building museums, uh, uh, libraries, and, um, and uh, public housing, permanent projects, that they, were, um, they, were, they would be held accountable for, um, for what, they were, what, they were, what they were projecting on the city. And surviving the test of time is extremely difficult these days, you know, unlike, uh, unlike maybe our parents or grandparents or further back in history, uh, buildings, uh, buildings could, could, um, could be affirmative for quite a long period of time. I think Yabani is a very good example from this to that in no time. So my temporary buildings were in the present and I did not really worry about what would happen to them as I would bury them. Uh, they would be gone before my time. Uh, unlike what my colleagues were doing with the more permanent buildings. But it turns out this is what happens to you in Beirut when you're so affirmative. And you can control what you do down to the last bolt because you're staging every little thing down to the ashtray, which is what I did in my first six temporary buildings. On a more serious note, uh, we were invited, I was invited to, uh, to, to compete, to design a, um, a modern uh, art museum for Beirut, the BEMA, for those of you 
who have heard of the Beymar the institution. And um, initially, I, um, I refused uh, to be part of this as uh, I was not very convinced of the notion of the museum uh, in Beirut, the institution that one would, uh, that, that one would, 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 um, would implement in Beirut as if Beirut was just another city. Uh, obviously, a museum in Beirut uh, could not be thought of as a museum in Lyon or in Rotterdam or even in Qatar or, uh, or Abu Dhabi or God knows where. Uh, simply because, uh, because Lebanon is a failed state that has no institutions. And if anything interesting happened over the last 30 or 40 years, it certainly did not happen through the institutions. That's the first thing. And the other issue is this question of history. Uh, none of us agree uh, uh, on, on, uh, on, on even the history of modern art in our part of the world. Hmm? Even my colleagues and friends, uh, the artists I, I, I work with and um, who are my friends, we do not agree on who has the legitimacy over uh, writing this history. Um, so I don't think we were ready for a museum. But right before the deadline, a friend of mine who's a brilliant artist who, worked, who has worked a lot on this subject, Walid Raad, for those of you who know him, tells me, we have to do something, even though we do not necessarily abide by the rules of the competition, we have to give them an answer. And the answer was stage zero. Uh, stage zero is a hole uh, on the site uh, in preparation of the building that would come the day we're ready to build an institution, a museum. The day we're ready to have acquisitions. Uh, we're ready to say this will make it in history or this will not make it in history. But in the meantime, we just make a hole in the site. Walid had researched also the collections, um, the private collections, and there are a few in Lebanon uh, that he has researched very thoroughly. So the idea is to give caves in the hole, in the hole that, we, uh, that we dig on the site, caves literally, uh, one to each of these collectors. Interesting to see that this museum we're proposing would not make any acquisitions. It would rest on uh, the acquisitions of about a dozen uh, collectors who collected art without any accountability. Very diverse collections that don't pretend to give any sort of objective uh, overview of the history of contemporary art or modern art in the region. Just like our paysage, just like our, uh, our situation uh, in Beirut. Very schizophrenic maybe, but we would have um, scaffoldings going down to the bottom of this very deep hole, uh, um, construction site elevators, and that would give you access uh, to these, um, to these uh, caves um, inside the hole in the gut of the site. We were disqualified. Don't laugh, I'm very serious. I'm very serious because I think our museum would have been, you know, it takes Five to seven percent of the budget, come on, ten percent maybe because we dig very, we would dig very deep uh, to to make that excavation. Ten percent of the cost of construction of the of a, of, of an actual building, and would be saving the costs of um, of acquisitions and digging a hole, and 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 retaining walls for that hole would take less than nine months that museum would have been up and running for very little money and uh, would have sent shockwaves across the art world and would have been a, a very, very contextual museum in the political sense of the term. But we were disqualified by the dinosaurs, Rem Koulas and company. So I sometimes get uh, commissioned by uh, museums and um, um, that helps me um, do some work outside of my commissions or the realities of my commissions. This was for the Maxi Museum in Rome. It's called the Railing Beirut. We mapped uh, the city and looked at points that were fetishized in the post-war um, uh, period. And we tried to connect these, to connect the dots and apply another layer to the city that would serve the curious uh, tourist to understand the city in a split second or very, very fast. And we imagined that these layers could be tracks um, connecting the dots. And we've imagined the, um, the apparatus, um, 
that uh, would be that would contain the tourist in his very high speed um, venture into the city. Uh, so this is it going in, in and out of the Holiday Inn Museum in a split second. And this is it uh, entering my office. So we built the damn thing very seriously. We rolled it around the city until the secret services of the army arrested my team. And I had to make a lot of phone calls to get them out because we were accused of planting evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Beirut, which could ignite a war with the enemy, <coughs> giving them an excuse. Uh, to bombard Beirut once more. So much for the secret services of the army. You can see uh, in my work a fascination for the military, yes. This is POW, a device that we have very seriously designed uh, and built. It is a drone, a human propelled drone. It looks strangely like the F-117 uh, stealth bomber, but it doesn't fly, it crawls, it's extremely slow. And it is conceived to exchange uh, prisoners across enemy lines. And the two things you see in the cockpit are cameras that help scan the territory as the prisoner crosses the enemy lines before he's released. This is another uh, um, apparatus we've built and um, that we've staged. Um, many of these, of these projects were put in situation in the city uh, that never stopped bleeding. Um, but we've also done more serious work. <laughs> this is, uh, I think, probably the largest built uh, development I have executed in, in Beirut. It's over 25,000 square meters of sellable areas in one single building. But the reason why I'm showing you this project is because of its uh, of its, uh, also its, its problems and its difficulties. Initially, uh, when this plot was brought to me, uh, it didn't take much time to uh, understand that it was not build a buildable plot, because out of the 400 and something meters of its uh, periphery, uh, only uh, 11 meters intersected with public domain, meaning in over 98% of its perimeter, it was subject to blind walls. Now, looking at that, you understand the complete failure of the state and the uh, complete absence of any uh, uh, regulating mechanisms uh, to uh, help uh, regulate the growth of our fabric. And Beirut is, is full of these uh, catastrophic accidents due to the lack of master planning. So I advised my client to uh, not purchase this plot, but the man was very stubborn because it was a very good deal in terms of numbers, and basically told me that if I wouldn't do it, he'd do it without me. And that he could go to the um, Higher Council of Urbanism and get an exception that would allow him to build the highest tower in Beirut that he would tuck at one end of the site, uh, leaving a good 100 meters of setback inside the plot. And he tells me, with a lot of cynicism, uh, you know, this is the story of our city. If the, city, if the state doesn't give it to you, you, uh, you give it to yourself. Um, and when I saw that he was about to commit a crime, building uh, two blind walls that would go up over 300 meters, uh, I told him to stop and that I would take this catastrophic uh, um, uh, situation and try to deal with it. And what we've done is probably the most um, masochistic <laughs> project ever. We've decided not to go beyond the 50 meters allowed on site, not to ask for any exception. And we've decided to open up 100% of its periphery, because at this point in time, the building is surrounded by uh, agricultural land. Although it's pretty close to the, uh, to the Beirut Museum, for some strange reason, uh, most of the plots around it were not built when I designed it. Um, probably because a lot of these plots are owned by the state. But still, eventually, at some point, uh, these will be built. And they will take light, legal light, from their intersection with the public domain and would turn their back to us, most probably. So what I've done is I've completely opened up my periphery and have had, <coughs> have had a completely uh, um, uh, permeable facade. This was uh, a rule I've inflicted upon myself. 
and stepped back the strict minimum four and a half meters at ground and then kept on stepping back upwards according to the setback law up to 50 meters and tried to fit the plateaus according to the setback law. So I did not design this building. Uh, it's the building law in, interpreted it in the most um, um, uh, masochistic, I would say suicidal way because any moron could come across uh, you know, your property line and turn your back to you, which could be a disaster. But in the meantime, I've opened my arms um, completely naked uh, to all potential neighbors on 360 degrees. And I smile when I, hear, when I hear people telling me that this building looks aggressive because I think it is the kindest gesture what could have done on this site because, um, because it never turns its back on 100% of its periphery to any potential neighbor. And by doing that, uh, we came up with, well, the result were very, very interesting typologies that would not have happened in your regular, uh, you know, um, party wall uh, regulated uh, condition. And we've taken that logic uh, all the way, meaning in some of these apartments have more terraces than interior space. And the handrail is not a handrail, it's at bar height, a meter ten, and it's 50 centimeters deep, so at this point uh, you can have your breakfast or your lunch on the handrail uh, at this point enjoying the view of the agricultural land around you, but maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road uh, have a conversation with your neighbor across the street if the developer and the stupid architect did not turn their back to us. I'm a very optimistic person. But there is a very uh, interesting relationship between these apartments now and, and, and very odd, yet very, uh, very uh, terrace-like apartments that are, that are very open and very permeable. I can very uh, proudly say that I do contradict myself from one street corner to the other, sometimes simultaneously on the same type of program in this city, in this, um, in this very schizophrenic city. So, while I was designing this, I was designing that, which uh, is a very different animal because it's on a different site. So you see, I don't like to talk about Beirut in, in any consensual terms because every plot and every condition takes you, if you're really contextual, obsessively contextual like I am, uh, takes you to a different scenario and, and a different interpretation and hopefully a different condition. Here we are at the edge of uh, East-West Beirut, at the edge of the so-called Solidaire, of the, the, the city, uh, the, the former city center, and uh, facing the port. And on a very high, um, well, a high density uh, exploitation factor, uh, facing the uh, Beit el uh, the Falangist Party headquarters, right at the demarcation line. For those of you who know Beirut, uh, you would certainly understand what I mean by the Roman salute. And uh, it took me years to, uh, to say it because I thought that someone would pick it up, but strangely nobody did. So a few months ago, I, I said the Roman salute <laughs> in a conference, and uh, the person who, was invited, who invited me took me aside at the end and told me, you cannot use this term. <laughs> so, see, Europeans take things very, uh, you know, at first degree, uh, in a very literal way. But um, this is a building that addresses the port. This is a very contextual building. It is not beige. Um, it is not the postcard Beirut. It is a building that is very much in tune. It is a fortress, um, a very porous fortress, but a fortress with a lot of um, um, uh, control devices on its facade uh, that um, are very much about its, um, its, its location and the very specific issues about this site. This building was, complete in, uh, was completed in 2020. See, this is the arm um, saluting the city center and the demarcation line from above over Martyr Square. Um, I did a lot of these high-rise, many, many high-rise um, uh, residential developments. This is another one in that same area, just a, 
a couple of years before. You see it if you follow my cursor right here. And this time, very literally addressing the port. This building stood uh, very much in dialogue with the port, uh, as this part of Beirut, I think, uh, is very much um, well, in proximity of the port. But um, to me, the Jamez Imam Khail, if you know the geography of Beirut, is not beige once more, uh, and is not the postcard that the so-called preservationists will try to uh, sell you. Uh, Beirut is a port city. And here is this thing that uh, was finished in 2014, 2015, and um, looks almost like a transformer or like a, um, you know, these toys for kids or a, um, or a sentinel overlooking the port. Um, almost uh, very, in a very military posture. Uh, completed in 2015 with some absurd conditions on its roof terraces and the two cannons pointing uh, uh, towards uh, the uh, shore. But then comes August 4th. And this building was at the forefront, uh, literally at the edge of, it was 300 meters from the limits of the port. So it was the first tower to take the hit and was completely destroyed and demolished disfigured, nothing was left except the concrete. We had to uh, rebuild everything. And um, a few weeks after the blast, and we had uh, many, many casualties uh, inside the building, um, the co-owners met to see what they could do. And uh, well, many people were trying to um, help in whatever ways they could. So I offered my services to rehabilitate this building and I offered uh, to design a, a, new, a new facade for this building uh, that would not be its original facade. And that would hopefully uh, be also a political act, a political act in the sense that it would no longer be clad with um, aluminum composite panels that are imported from China, but it would be hopefully clad with something, with a material that would be transformed locally. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, it will not look the same but uh, we would be stitching uh, the wounds of uh, the catastrophe of August 4th. And I got a green light initially from all the corners, but as we moved forward, things became a bit more complicated. This building next to it was also a building I had just completed. So, Forensic architecture did a, did a, did a case on, um, on, the, on the August 4 blast, and um, the, three, uh, the three locations that they studied were um, the, uh, the hangar in which, in which the ammonium nitrate was stocked, uh, the silos uh, which protected Beirut uh, and kept on uh, you know, uh, decomposing and, and falling until just a few months. And the third case was our building, to try to study the impact of the blast. And this is, uh, these are documents developed by forensic architecture. So, but then um, we started off by, I would say, literally like a medical operation. We had the initial elevations. Uh, we knew exactly where the panels, the initial cladding panels were located. Uh, they were numbered. So we did a photographic survey of all the facades, and then we, had, we categorified the state of the panels from intact to, uh, to completely blown up in the air and disappeared. And there were several categories in the middle. And according to that, we've developed a software that could, according to the shape, the proximity of the panels, their shape, the impact on the neighboring panels, would start uh, illustrating uh, through the number of vertices on each panel, according to its state, uh, would graphically uh, translate as scientifically as we could uh, the impact of the blast on these panels, so on the facade. And we've decided that these could be the beginning of our stitching operation. It took us months to do that because it was a very, um, a very precise, as much as we could, survey. So we would start with, uh, let's say, 
uh, this damage zone and then uh, we would stitch things back according to the state of the panels. And this is what happens. And um, we're almost done with it now. I didn't really, I have very early photos of, uh, of the stitching process, but this is where we're at. And this will be it for tonight. Thank you very much for that riveting talk. I will now be moving to the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And then if you'd like, you can introduce yourself. Saeed uh, Lehnidi. It's a, an if question, actually. Uh, if you were asked to uh, design and build the Central Bank of Lebanon, how, how would you approach that uh, philosophically, conceptually? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very tricky question. <laughs> um, well, my answer to you is that uh, this would probably be a, a very fascinating, uh, uh, complicated, complex, um, perilous exercise, which would make it very interesting. Um, I think the most interesting projects are those you don't have an answer for at the outset. And, um, and um, they, have to be, they have to be very contextual and something has to, be, has to develop according to it. So I don't have an answer right out of my drawer, certainly not. But I would take it, yes. <laughs> I once said that uh, my dream project would be a, um, a nightclub in Mecca and a, uh, and a mall at the Vatican. So why not the Central Bank of Beirut, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Claire. I'm a current student at Columbia. Um, I'm curious as to what the processes and challenges are in terms of executing these designs, in terms of structural engineering, zoning, complicated laws, and also working with contractors and builders as situations evolve. What does that look like for you? I, I was fortunate not to work for any architecture office right out of school except for very uh, short uh, stays as an intern at Nouvelle's office where I didn't do much. <laughs> so um, my dad was an architect, certainly a better architect than myself, but I, I stayed away from him. Um, so I started practicing without any prior professional experience, which I think was very good for me. Uh, the first building I ever executed, which was this club underground, uh, as I was, I mean, things happened very fast, but as I was uh, drawing it, I showed it to contractors who looked at me with a smile and told me that it was too early for me to start building because everything about it was wrong. And, uh, and that's when I decided to turn my back to contractors and the construction industry and uh, to, uh, to build alliances outside of that with, um, with artisans uh, who really know their trade. Uh, for that truck builder who built garbage trucks, it was a piece of cake. The whole roof of BO18 cost me $57,000, including the hydraulic systems. And it was supposed to be there for only five years. It is almost 25 years old now. It never leaked. I never, I never even painted the six, cent, six millimeters thick uh, steel panels. Uh, the, uh, the surface uh, corroded, the, the, uh, the, the upper surface corroded and then protected uh, the, the core of the steel panels and it's still there. You know what leaked? What leaked were the, were the, the, uh, the underground walls which had um, which had a waterproofing membrane that were from the construction industry. So what was right turned out to be wrong, and what was wrong turned out to be right. That was the early years. And then, um, 
And as you move on to larger, to larger scale, a bigger scale, it becomes more difficult to experiment because you have to go through all these uh, procedures. Um, but still, we really try to, uh, as much as we can, to, uh, to uh, try to, to work a bit outside of that. Um, I don't know if that this answers the question of the, of, the, of the construction techniques, but we were very fortunate in Lebanon until now uh, to have uh, very flexible contractors uh, and have incredible respect for these people. I'm not talking about the paper pushers. I'm talking about the subcontractors, those who really work and know their trades. I'm talking about the metal workers. I'm talking about the carpenters. I'm talking about those who build uh, those who know how to work with concrete and cast it properly and build incredible molds and so on. I'm not talking about, I hate paper pushers. <laughs> uh, uh, but nowadays, unfortunately, the profession is ruled by, uh, by these bureaucrats uh, who, in fact, don't know their trade. You know, I find myself sometimes facing little idiots who are not even 30 years old and built a thing telling me, you can't do this, you do that, because that's the book. And those are the standards of the industry. Um, and these are the people who oblige you to build in Amman, just like you'll build in, in, uh, in, in Dubai or in, or in Shanghai or in Houston. Huh? And I don't agree with that. I think every, every, every part of this world has its little secrets, its know-hows, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, specialty trades. And we should uh, revive these and work on keeping those alive. It's very important. Uh, hi, thank you for the lecture. It was very inspiring and uh, very creative. Uh, I wonder why did you uh, decide to change the look for the, the last uh, building uh, to have a new look when you re renovated it? It was beautiful and I wonder what was the purpose, of, you know, how, what, wh why did you decide to change it? Because I thought its scars would make it look much better, much more uh, intelligent, much more. I don't think the building, I don't think this building, I don't think the fabric around it uh, should come out of what's happened as if nothing had ever happened. Um, it is exactly, and I wanted to finish my talk with this, start it with Evolving Scars and finish it with this because most of my work has been about, uh, about uh, trying as much as I can with, it, with, with, with our limited means as architects to, uh, to, uh, to interact with, uh, with our environment in, in, in our context in a very serious way. When I say contextual, I mean contextual in, in the political sense of the term. Um, and sometimes uh, this might take you to uh, sour stories, uh, not sugar-coated, but that's fine. You know? Uh, maybe the ending of the movie is not a Hollywood ending, and the hero is not, uh, you know, is not does not come out of it uh, without any scars. It's okay, uh, but that makes a, a good story, a real story at least. So that building could not come out of what has happened without reacting to what has happened, and and even more because I don't think the state will ever do anything about this. Uh, the investigation is blocked. Um, there are no, uh, there is no institution that has, um, uh, that has any authority or any or any credibility to, uh, to to erect any sort of uh, monument or or, uh, or project or, or or anything that that would uh, that would witness what has happened. The state is absent, and it's it's. I find it uh, maybe odd that. Uh, I, I'm doing it in a bourgeois building, huh? but that's Beirut. Maybe this is our part of the world. It might be the same here. I don't know. Thank you. And by the way, the, 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 what we've proposed ended up costing 30% less than if you were to rehabilitate uh, exactly as it was initially. And my promise to the co-owners was that I would deliver a project uh, that, would, that, would, uh, that would save them the cost of importing 
uh, with hard currencies, which was not available at that point and still is not. Uh, so that was a very important thing also. Uh, anyway. <coughs> Thank you, Bernard. Uh, my name is Raid Wahbe. Um, you have said more than once that uh, you are deeply contextualized when you design in a city like Beirut. And the way I see it is uh, your buildings are going in paradox to the existing urban structure, which I understand from your political status as... Are going what from uh, the... Are in paradox with the existing okay. uh, urban structure, yeah. which I, I understand from your uh, notion that you, are, you want to... Sorry for my, excuse my French, for the screw you uh, of the existing or, or of the norm that is there. But <clears throat> my question to you is, what if uh, you have uh, designed a development in the middle of Beirut, and that development was uh, designed by your, uh, your architecture, your kind of architecture, and you have come again 15 years later and you wanted to do something else. It was very interesting what happened to your building the way you stitched it, I would under <clears throat> I thought you might add a little bit of color or something, because the way the way I see your architecture is that you always develop something new and something out of the norm. And my question to you is, do you think that one day you might come back and consider working in um, concrete or something that is actually more contextualized to the existing? than uh, what you propose? Yani in 20 years' time. I don't know if I'll be around in 20 years, but, <laughs> but um, I work with concrete. I, I don't have, um, it's not like we're stuck with a single material. I, I use whatever is there and whatever makes sense. Um, um, and they're not necessarily aesthetic choices. Um, uh, we're very pragmatic when it comes to uh, to uh, the construction techniques, and it's very tough. You know, there are decisions that you don't take arbitrarily, but they're very often uh, driven by cost, as I work for the private sector, and all of the operations I've been involved in, in Beirut at least, uh, uh, are from the private sector. I have never worked for the public sector. So, um, I am not one designing a museum in, uh, in Holland or or in France or in Italy where, uh, you know, you're given sometimes absurd budgets of construction and you can, you can choose to build in whatever material uh, you, uh, you choose. Um, I build with, with extremely, extremely tight budgets. Um, you would not believe, uh, you know, the cost per square meter of some of these developments. So it's, it's, it's one very important parameter that we, we deal with. Um, I don't know if this answers your, your question about materials, but... Um, my, my question is, um, if you are designing something in development that is, let's say, in New York, okay, having a structure might be something of a, a different paradox than the one you're designing in Beirut. For example, in Beirut, you're building between a stone building. In Beirut, you're building between stone buildings. And, and somewhere else you might be building between steel structures. I see you that as a rebellious architect against the urban texture that you are building in, even though you say it's contextualized and I understand where well, you come from. Well, my, my, my understanding of the fabric is not, uh, is not purely, uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not the morphology of the fabric that I, that I find of, of primary importance. I think uh, there's something much deeper in the fabric than what we see, than the matter and the material. That's why I keep saying Beirut, Beirut is not beige. You know, I was banned from Solidaire, although commissioned directly by Solidaire, many buildings that were never built. <laughs> in fact, I counted 11 commissions inside the perimeter of the Solidaire development. For those of you who don't know Solidaire, is, it's a private company in charge of rebuilding the city center in the post-war years. Um, Strangely, I did, not I did not build, I designed, but I did not build anything inside the Solidaire perimeter. 
uh, I built all around it, but never inside. And now with you know, years have passed and I look back and it's maybe because my buildings are not beige. <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, they, have, they have their uh, interpretation of what Beirut is. And I, and I said earlier, I am at war with these very consensual, dangerously simplistic definitions of what context is. Uh, they're very reductive. Uh, Beirut is far more complex than that, far more complex than what Solidaire has, has tried to, uh, to, uh, to define it. Medina Ariqa lil Mustaqbal. I don't know if you, if you, for those of you who are familiar with post-war reconstruction Beirut, it was the slogan of Solidaire. Ariqa lil Mustaqbal. I find it very interesting. Ariqa, deeply rooted lil Mustaqbal, for the future. There is no reference to the present. I'm a man of the present. Huh? Um, and the, the past is this, uh, is this very, uh, it's, it's this Western fantasy of uh, this postcard, a very reductive image of what Beirut's past is. In fact, nothing makes it beyond the independence when it comes to the past. Huh? Uh, to this date, uh, anything beyond 1943 is not historical. We don't look at modern buildings, at the modern era. In fact, the modern republic, the independent republic of Lebanon, post-1943, as being part of our history. That's a serious problem. Huh? That's the history. That's the past. And then the future, strangely, is this corporate recipe huh? that we blindly import, us Arabs. I mean, it's the story of, of the failed new Arab cities. Dubai being on the top of the list, followed very closely by what's, what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia in the coming years. You know, get American corporate firms, a few star architects, uh, to sell you crap, really, literally. Have you seen one interesting building in Dubai? Raise your hand. One. None. Second rate imports of things, you, things you've seen uh, somewhere else. That's the future, an imported modernity. See, back, uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, we had our, we had our little um, chance at, 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 at the modern project, even through modern locals who thought they were part of the game. Maybe at the time we were, you know, it was, it was a time of, of universal certainties. Uh, but yes, you had, you had young moderns at the time, my father was one of them, who thought they were at the forefront of the modern project. For Solidaire and others, the Arab cities in general, the modern project is one that you buy. You have to go to Morphosis, Oma, Kupi Melblau, Zaha Hadid, who's not even here anymore, that I don't really consider as an Arab. Uh, and that is a serious problem. So I think, I think it's a project that should emerge from within, uh, within and not um, otherwise you have a failed modernity a failed modern project, a failed fabric, and a failed social fabric at the end, and a failed political project, and a bankruptcy. <laughs> Thank you.